of what exactly is life enhancing? What does this phrase mean? And do we now need to reframe the discussion about sustainability with this new, I say new concept or a slightly different emphasis, which is regeneration? Because um, Fritjof, for many years, you've been talking about the need to switch um, our concept of growth. It's not that we, we shouldn't grow. It's the fact that we need to change our concept um, or thinking away from quantitative, quantitative growth to qualitative growth. So, Daniel, it, it's fantastic to have you on this call, you know, as an author who has very much written extensively about regeneration. Um, recently, there was an article in The Guardian talking about the need to switch from sustainability to the concept of regeneration. So given the fact that, you know, for many years, you know, Fritjof's systems view of life has very much been inspiring people, why do you feel now that a lot of people who have already been working in the area of sustainability are now kind of uh, focusing on the concept of regeneration? What is regeneration for you? When, when I, in 2006 um, was working on or between 2003 and 2006 was working on my PhD which I thought was going to be in design for sustainability about a year and a half into the PhD I realized that there's somehow and I'm not I know that there's a lot of people who work in sustainability who have a fully regenerative understanding of sustainability so this is not a replacement of one term with another it's just the, the, the strength that what, what came out for me while I was doing my PhD research is that sustainability as a word doesn't actually tell us what we're trying to sustain. Um, it's, it could be applying to all sorts of, uh, applied to all sorts of things. And um, so in the end, I changed the title of my PhD to Design for Human and Planetary Health. From a systems view of life, um, that's the, the, the pattern of health the pattern that connects, that, that brings health and well-being to the entire holarchy of life from cells to organisms to communities to the whole biosphere. Um, that's what we're trying to sustain. The word regenerative more clearly speaks to this need for regenerating the patterns of life because basically what has happened over the last 150 or 250 years since the industrial revolution is that we have caused so much damage to the system um, deforested emitted so much carbon that it, we need to do a lot more than simply not adding any more damage which is one interpretation of sustainability um, as Bill McDonough used to say sustainability is 100 percent less bad it's the neutral point but you can move beyond that. And um, Bill, Bill Reed has created a wonderful, and then the people at Regenesis Group have de de um, developed a wonderful spectrum where you go beyond sustainability into restorative, but restorative can still be done in the mindset of humanity over nature, rather than humanity yeah. as participant in nature as nature. And when it's done like that, we get these projects where people plant eucalyptus trees in, in dry areas and, and celebrate that they've planted 100,000 or a million trees, and then they die a year later. So that's, that's the kind of engineering mindset of restorative. And then there's this step of reconciliatory where we put humanity back in nature. We understand that we are participants deeply <clears throat> dependent on the planetary life support system, and only when we intend to design as nature, not just learning from nature, but own our own agency as living beings in this process, can we start to work regenerative? And, and the, the point being that you could even go back all the way to beginnings of agriculture 5,000 years ago. We have a long history of this destroying having a destructive impact on the planet, and we have the potential as human beings to be key, keystone species um, and actually positively influence, bring back forests where there are deserts now. Uh, the, the work that John Liu is doing in, uh, that he reported on, on the, the China Leus Plateau is a great example and, and now Common Land Foundation is, is doing work in Australia, in South Africa and, and now in Spain trying to, to give 
big examples of how whole regions that are arid and desertified can, through wise human intervention, become more abundant, more bioproductive, not just for human needs, but for the wider community of life, as, as the Earth Charter says. So yeah, re regeneration is about that. Yeah. It seems to me that uh, this term, uh, these terms, generative and regenerative, are really uh, sort of terms that have come up in, in recent years and are being used uh, more and more. Uh, I remember, for example, the book by Marjorie Kelly, which is called Owning Our Future. And she, uh, she argues that at the very heart of corporate structures is a certain uh, concept of ownership. And she distinguishes between extractive ownership and generative ownership. And so she, she wants to redesign ownership and not she wants doesn't want to redesign, but she she gives uh, dozens of examples of companies of organizations who have redesigned ownership uh, toward a generative ownership, and she talks about a generative economy. Uh, as Daniel just said, there are many people who talk about regenerative agriculture. But I want to say a few more words about sustainability because. I will continue to use this term and I want to explain why and how also maybe to show that there's some diversity among us. We don't, we don't, well, we agree on the basics, but we have you no know, different, different approaches that are mutually uh, compatible. So um, sustainability, the problem I see with sustainability, it's not in the term sustainable, but it lies in the fact that from the very beginning, it has been combined with the term development. And so most people actually don't talk about sustainability, but about sustainable development. And this is very problematic. It's problematic because the term development has two very different meanings in biology and in economics. For biologists, development is a very basic property of all life. All living organisms develop. And it implies a kind of multifaceted unfolding of organisms or ecosystems or societies moving toward fulfilling their potential in a very broad, multifaceted way. Now, economists have narrowed this down to a single linear economic dimension measured usually in per capita GDP. And so they have uh, compressed the richness of human existence into this one linear quantitative parameter. And so if development is used in that economic sense, and especially if it is associated with unlimited economic growth, which is manifestly unsustainable on a finite planet, then uh, sustainable development is an oxymoron and development of that kind will never be sustainable. And if we combine development with regenerative, we will have exactly the same problem. As long as we use development in this narrow economic sense, it's hopeless. It, it will not be sustainable, nor will it be regenerative. And in fact, this is what we observe today, that the economic environment today is not life enhancing uh, in the beautiful way that, that we, we heard in the preamble of the Earth Charter, but is increasingly life destroying. Today, as, as everybody knows, we have turbulent markets, we have corporate mergers with uh, rapid structural changes, we have increasing workloads, we have demands for round-the-clock availability, and so all this combines to create an economic environment that is profoundly unhealthy, stressful and unhealthy. And so the task is to create a new kind of economic environment that is um, life-enhancing, uh, that is uh, carbon neutral, free of toxic uh, food, uh, supportive of communities with uh, 
you know, living wages, uh, humane working conditions, and so on. So, so that is the task. Daniel, you've been um, involved in many projects. How, are pe how have people responded to this framing of sustainability? Because it is, it's um, really wonderful to hear, you know, Fritjof's passion when really talking about what really needs to change. And um, I know you've got, you know, um, a number of examples of projects, mm -hmm. which for you really demonstrate um, this notion of changing people's understanding of economics and what really needs to happen. Simon, I'm sorry for oh, interrupting. And excuse me, Daniel, for no, I want to add something to show that we are thinking along the same lines, that we are not fighting one another. And, and to do this, let me give our viewers my definition of sustainability. Okay, a sustainable community is one whose ways of life, that is technologies, physical structures, businesses, social institutions, and so on, do not interfere with nature's inherent ability to sustain life. And then we ask, how does nature sustain life? And when we study that, we find that there are a number of principles of organization that ecosystems have evolved to sustain life over billions of years. And one of these principles is that every ecological process involves continual generation and regeneration. And so sustainability understood in that way intrinsically uh, includes regeneration. Okay. Yes, sir, Daniel. Yeah, I, com I, com I completely agree. Um, let me just pick up two things that uh, Fritjof was absolutely right with, with, with pointing out the almost insidiousness of combining the term sustainability with development because it also created that entire framing of underdeveloped uh, nation and developed nation, which was disastrous and, and, and led to a whole new wave of, of um, economic colonialization. Um, but at the same time, just as we said earlier with growth, um, shifting from quantitative to qualitative growth, I think we need to reclaim these terms like growth and development from a biological, ecologically informed systems view of life. and. Um, these words aren't inherently bad, like there's a lot of talk about degrowth. As Fritjof said about development, development is natural in nature, the same with growth. It's just that in nature, things grow exponentially at the beginning and then they shift from the exponential curve to the logistics curve. And, and at that shift, when it, when it bends the curve, that's when qualitative development starts. So um, in terms of the, the, your question of Regenerate, regenerative development projects. One of the, the biggest ones that I've had the pleasure of being involved in is um, that was started with the Commonwealth Secretariat last October through a meeting in London and there's been a series of follow-up meetings this year is regenerative development to reverse climate change. It's, it's an attempt to, just like the Earth Charter said that we have a lot of peril but we have a lot of opportunity. It's to reframe the conversation we have about uh, climate change without in the slightest saying it's not five past 12 and we really need to act. Um, but to say this is a massive opportunity, we can actually, as we need to shift out of fossil fuels, as we are now in a situation that it doesn't matter whether we've passed peak oil or not, because we can't actually burn all the oil and all the carbon that exists, because if we do, we go past the 1.5 um, degree planet. Um, we need to reframe the conversation about climate change to say it is actually possible through the right use of technologies and the right behavior change to reverse climate change or reverse global warming. Um, Paul Hawken just launched a project Drawdown, which documents in detail, not just technological, but also social measures that would result in this kind of carbon reduction. And we are absolutely capable of bringing the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere from the current over 400 back down to under 250 within the lifetime of many of the people alive today. We, it's not an exact science, but I think by 2070 we could easily be there. 
Um, and in order to do that, we need to engage in this kind of regenerative development. And the current Ge um, Secretary General of the Commonwealth Secretariat, Lady Patricia Scotland, has shown an amazing amount of leadership, pulling people together behind this. Um, you have to keep in mind that the Commonwealth is 52 nations, 2.3 billion people across the planet. Um, they cross all faith groups, they, they cross all continents. Um, I think 60% of them are under 29. So we're really talking about the future of humanity. And at the same time, we're talking about countries that are in the front line of climate change, small developing islands in, in the Caribbean and in the South Pacific. These are islands that will be underwater if we don't act. And so it's, it's this reframe. But what's so important about this initiative is that Patricia Scotland is now trying to get the, local, the, the government leaders of the 52 nations to sign up to this before COP23. And as part of this, she is talking about local development. So very much, this is one of my definitions of um, what is regenerative. It's elegant solutions carefully adapted to the biocultural uniqueness of place. So we have to work from place and in place at a scale where we work with communities. The economic knee-jerk response is how do we scale it up? In this, scale, in this case, we don't scale up, we spread. We, we do regenerative development at the small community or regional city scale, and we do it everywhere. Millions of projects around the globe, and that will get the carbon drawdown going. But it will do much more than that. It will allow us to systemically implement all 17 SDGs and give people the, the, the means to actually make this political ideal of subsidiarity a reality so people can actually have the power to make decisions about the place they live in which is currently not the case and um, so regenerative is is not just ecological it's social and it's economic because by doing that we create massive opportunities for we need to shift out of fossil fuels and so many of the things that surround us are made from fossil fuel byproducts and that means we need to shift our entire material culture towards a biomaterials based source this enables us to create analog forests all around the planet reforesting increasing the amount of standing forests but some of them a fraction is managed in an analog forestry kind of way and we draw the materials of our new material culture from these forests and and from growing these materials in the process we also lock carbon into plant matter and then we turn it into products and we lock carbon into products over a long period of time. So there's a, there's a massive opportunity here. And, and the beauty of this one project is that it's trying to talk to world leaders of 52 nations to get this rolling by November of this year. And there's a massive swell of support. Janine Benius is behind it. Paul Hawken is behind it. We had, um, you mentioned the article that Herbert Girardet wrote in The Guardian. Herbert Girardet was there. Um, all these people are waiting to get going once the funding comes in. And just last week, there was an important meeting in London to look at how, how can this initiative be funded. So um, Daniel, I don't want to uh, take too much time. A little while ago, you sounded to me like E.F. Schumacher uh, with uh, small scale, local, elegant solutions. Now, maybe most of our viewers will be too young to remember Schumacher, but he was the author of a, a really pioneering book, Small is Beautiful, and he was one of the great environmental pioneers. 